Hey fans and subscribers, this is your host Joe from the Gaming for Insight channel with you to host episode 11 of the Handheld United podcast. The topics we are covering tonight are on gaming devices in development with two of them integrating blockchain and cryptocurrency. More on that in the show. Joining us tonight for this podcast are three of your favorite channels, Handheld Hardware, Gamers Generation, and CPPC Tech. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. How's everybody doing this week? Buddy, how's it going? And us. Hello. Any of you watching the new Fallout series from last weekend or last Thursday, I think it was? Anyone catch that? I watched. Hell yeah. I got my I got my Fallout seventy six hoodie on right now. I've I've been enjoying it. I haven't finished the series yet, but very very much thoroughly enjoying it. That I'll, one has that one has a uh, AI robots in there or sentient creatures. It so does. Know. It does. I I thought yeah, one of them harvests organs. It's that Bethesda th storytelling that we just fall in love with when we play. All right, so for those of you watching us tonight, feel welcome to share your comments with us in the chat, and we will speak to them before we transition to the next segment. And speaking of AI, tonight is Trivia Night. Your favorite AI has some trivia for us on handheld gaming, so stay with us for that during the show. Okay, with introductions out of the way, let's transition to segment one. The company Sui announced via a tweet on April 10th, that it is excited to announce the first Playtron powered handheld titled the Sui Play Zero X1. That is the first blockchain native handheld games console with Web3 capabilities. That's quite a lot packed into that sentence. So there is much to break down with what I just stated. So let's do that part by part here in three parts. First, what is Playtron? Playtron is a lightweight gaming OS that serves as an all-in-one place to play games from Steam and Epic, for example. Simply put, Playtron extracts the gaming ecosystem from Windows. It is a Linux-based OS that is extricable from Steam. Second, what is blockchain technology in a gaming context? In brief, a blockchain allows for the usage of NFTs and cryptocurrencies as a form of monetization, which means that the purchasing of games does not need to use the forms of payment that we, that we are familiar with from a credit card or PayPal account, like on Steam when I purchase my games, I have my PayPal account linked. NFTs are non-fungible tokens that serve as unique identifiers, providing authenticity of ownership, and can take the form of specific digital assets like NFT art, which is in the form of a meme, music, or artwork as examples. Third and final part, what is Web3 and what are its capabilities? Well, first, Web 1.0 is defined as an earlier time, specifically from 1991 to 2004. Advancing to Web3 entails the usage of the Internet of Things, or IoT, as integrated. Web3 includes the usage of crypto wallets as well. Web3 connects devices like appliances and cars, hence IoT, and incorporates the advancements of machine learning and reasoning from products powered by AI, including Siri. So let's take all of this and bring it back to the gaming handheld space. Let's return now to the Sui Play Zero X1. This handheld promises gamers to be able to play anything from anywhere and buy games with digital currency. The release window is 2025 with a retail price expected as $500, according to The Verge. So let's transition now to the panel. Gamers Generation, if you don't mind, I'd like to start with you. What are your thoughts on a novel handheld like this? And is there any additional knowledge gamers need to have regarding Playtron, Blockchain, and Web3 for this handheld? Wait, wait a minute. Why am I being asked first? I, I feel attacked. Oh, you feel uh, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, I, I sort of feel like, you know, we're, we're, um, we're, we're going in a merry-go-round. I'm sure anyone who is listening has now turned it off after they heard NFTs. Um, 
But, you know, like, the problem with this is that the price point is just way too high. And I think that perhaps the knowledge base might be too deep as well. It's just, it's a strange amalgamation of things. It's like, I, I can't even, I, I can't even put an analogy to it is, is what I would say right now. There, for someone to be knowledgeable about both spaces, which I think is their target audience. When I say both spaces, I mean gaming or retro gaming. And then also like uh, blockchain or, um, you, you know, uh, like those other terms you use, blockchain, uh, you know, uh, NFTs and stuff like that. It, it's just, it's really strange, like uh, as a combination. And I don't even think any of these devices, well, either of these two devices is powerful enough to be more than, let's say, um, like a, a crypto wallet or something like that. I have to be honest with you, and I use the word novel when I introduce this in the question to you, because to me, it is something bizarre. I'm not accustomed to seeing something like this, and I remember when you shared it with the with us on Handhelds United, I went, what what exactly is this? But more on that, let me let me transition to to either CPPC Tech or Handheld Hardware for your thoughts and comments on this. Uh, yeah, sure. I'd like to go. Um, I am not the, uh, the biggest NFT fan. I, uh, honestly have never really quite understood it other than a potential way to launder money, <laughs> uh, which I've never gotten into NFTs. I don't, I don't own any that I'm aware of. I think I, I may have tried to look into buying an NFT once and I felt like I got ripped off somehow. Uh, I think that's kind of how most people feel is even if they own one, they feel like they got ripped off because a lot of them went down in value significantly. They just crashed like really bad. You saw Justin Bieber's and all your top end celebrities. And if you look at the value of their NFTs from what they paid for them to what they're worth now, it's like pennies on the dollar. I have a lot of crypto bro friends who are the utmost experts, I would say in this field that they own a lot of crypto and NFTs and they're very pro crypto and NFTs, and even they'll admit that they feel they got a bit scammed. Um, I don't know if a lot of you guys follow the whole BitBoy drama and all of that, but that's like a whole saga in and, and of we'll, itself. We're, that's going to be our next segment too. Sorry to interject, so, but just oh, you're good. Yeah. So the the whole trustworthiness of this device comes into question for me. Uh, first and foremost, I don't like anything uh, in the handheld space getting kind of like tagged along with this whole NFT because it, it really starts to muddy the waters in my opinion. I don't think the performance is going to be good on this device, much less the value of this device. It doesn't seem like a good value proposition. I think it's going to be sold for the lulls and the memes and the crypto bros and stuff like that. Anybody who's a big flexer on Twitter or X, um, who's always got those Lambos and those Rollies on their wrist, those are going to be the bros buying this. I think your average viewer here and real gamers you're not gonna probably be behind this are you no i don't think so i think this is going to be good for some jokes good for some laughs if it comes out and surprises us and it ends up doing well performance wise or there is a good value proposition that might introduce people back into the crypto space that would be cool but i just don't have high hopes for it i'm not a big nft fan at all so with the mention of that and bitboy mixed together i'm like no i'm out handheld hardware how about yourself what are your thoughts? So uh, just just taking a look at this, I, I know I read a while ago some article about NFTs and how they said it would be revolutionary for gaming because of the fact that you could take like potential skins and stuff for your weapons or your characters and you might be able to transfer them over to other games. And I thought the idea was good, but there's such a long road to get to that kind of point because you would need some sort of standardized formats that game developers and other things would need to adopt. And I think it would be cool at some point to maybe have like some sort of character skin that you could transfer between multiple games. But I don't expect to see that anytime in the near future. And I think that's just this is just another ploy at, hey, handhelds are successful. Let's go try our little twist on the successful handheld market and they said crypto and kind of like what gamers generation said uh it's kind of like a niche in a niche you know what are the odds you're going to find a gamer who wants a handheld that also is interested in all this other stuff nah, i think you're into such a low fraction that it's not going to be worth it in the end 
And there's been quite a bit that's invested in this. I can't remember the number off the top of my head, but there are, just based on the number, there are individuals that think this can be promising. And to go back to CPPC's point, this, it struck me at least as it's going to target a certain niche, but there seems to be, and we can discuss this and debate this, but two areas of focus for this. We have the integration of blockchain and NFTs and the use of cryptocurrency instead of linking your PayPal account. And then we have the versatility and the accessibility that Playtron as this Linux OS separate from Steam operating system is going to provide. So is this an attempt to reach two different types of gamers or two or or gamers that want two separate things is this handheld going to target those that want to use bitcoin cryptocurrency overall and the use of nfts and blockchain technology and then the other individual that wants to game on linux but doesn't want to be so tied to having to be within I've seen the word used, the Valve verse. Is that is that valid, invalid? What are your thoughts? I honestly think this is just a pull at um, an opportunity for someone to squeeze out some money out of the pie for uh, the handheld space. I, I see so many people trying to drop their hat in the ring who may have the best intentions possible, but it's not really going to benefit gamers. If if someone's wanted to use this device to get out of the Windows environment and use it on Linux and you know maybe play some of these entry-level emulators and stuff like that, there, there's a possibility that it could be a good device. And maybe if someone's not all about using cash and they've got hordes of Bitcoin laying around and they're like, hey, what better way to use my Bitcoin than to just buy stuff using this handheld with my Bitcoin, I mean, it could benefit some people out there, but the amount of people who benefit from it are, are far and few between. Yeah, I can go uh, next. Um, I'll say that the proposition of this Playtron device is kind of confusing also. I mean, the bridges, the amount of bridges that have been burnt by the term blockchain and NFT, even though those terms can be used independently, it, you know, are probably unquantifiable at this point. I mean, as a handheld hardware said, I, I think on paper, at least I think NFTs sound like they might be a reasonable idea. And, and I actually think, I actually think um, Zuckerberg and his whole idea, like the metaverse thing can play directly into that. He's been very smart not to use like the terms NFTs just because of, you know, how, uh, how much stigma is attached to those terms. And I actually had to look this up just now because I remember there were some there are some games or whatever that are being played on blockchain. And there is something out there. It's a, I guess it's called like Neoxa. And there's a number of different games that you can play. I just uh, apparently like GTA 5, you can play on this Neoxa blockchain. So my understanding of it is, is like you're basically playing on a private server. And then if you get something in that or whatever, it's saved on the blockchain or basically it's written in each one of those uh, gamers, uh, you know, like data. And so that's how you would also utilize um, the coin, uh, I guess, like Neoxa in this case. And so like if Playtron is somehow capitalizing on that, and like you said, Joe, um, not tying people directly into the Valve verse, like let's say you can play this, uh, you can play in this Playtron universe or whatever. So you play a number of these private servers or whatever. I mean, it's possible that this has value, but I don't think it's going to get any kind of traction because just as CPPC said, I mean, nobody's going to buy this except for, yeah, you know, people on Twitter or whatever who are, who are trying to flex. So that means you have your private server of what, like 10 people or something like th there's no value in that. What I'd like to do is introduce the other device that CPPC tech mentioned and that we have planned to talk about. I want to bring in the details of the BitBoy, but before I do that so that we can continue the conversation out of relevance to blockchain and cryptocurrency. Are there any comments, Gamers Generation, on the Sui Play Zero X1 before I introduce the BitBoy? Um, Paco's just saying that uh, you've seen one, you've seen them all. Fair point, Pac. Fair point. 
All right. So let let me introduce some details on the BitBoy that CPPC was was about to mention. On April third, ORD.io issued a tweet for a BitBoy One gaming handheld that looks like an older version of the Game Boy. At least it reminded me of that very much. This handheld resembles third-party gaming devices released by Anbernek. This is going to be familiar to some of you, and uses the Rock Chip RK two five six six processor. It has a 3.45-inch 640 by 480 screen, 32 gigabyte of internal storage, a 256 gigabyte TM storage card slot, 4 gigabytes of RAM, and a 3500 mAh battery pack that is expected to last if having been fully charged up to 6 hours. This handheld will run not only on older classic games, but will also run Bitcoin base games from the ORDZ, that's O-R-D-Z, company. This collaboration will allow for incentives to earn airdrop rewards, you heard that right, for gamers that own the handheld. Rewards will likely come in the form of Bitcoin BRC-20, a runes token, or NFT-like Bitcoin ordinals inscriptions. The BitBoy can run emulators for playing classic games like the original PlayStation and older game consoles. Pre-orders will launch sometime this month with an official release sometime later this year. The price point, according to Decrypt.co, is around $500. And I actually, I wanted to transition to start, if, if all right with you, Gamers Generation, only because on your channel... You have reviewed the Anbernic RG35 line gaming handheld that's relatable to this BitBoy and have even shown the MiU, that's M-I-Y-O-O, Mini Plus, doing a showdown between the two in one of your videos. I wanted to ask, how does adding the Bitcoin option or feature to a device like this make it more appealing as a gaming handheld if on the BitBoy and not on the Sui Play Zero X1, or can we expect both of them to go in the direction that we've discussed so far with the show, one not being more appealing than the other? Yeah, great question, Joe. Um, what's, inter what's potentially interesting about this device compared to the Sui Play? The Sui Play seems to try and be one of these modern contemporary handholds, like the one we, like the ones we've all had experience with, uh, in terms of like the ROG Ally and the Legion Go. Not counting the Claw because that shouldn't be counted. Um, I think that this thing has a different kind of potential because maybe a private server or privately hosted game that's like a retro game has some kind of value, as in. Let's say you're going to play Ninja Turtles, like the old arcade Ninja Turtles uh, um, or the SNES Ninja Turtles, and that could be like privately hosted. I think that in that situation, if wi it's Wi-Fi capable and you can play it that way, there could be some value there um, over devices like the Anbernic and the Mew, uh, Mini Plus that you mentioned. Um, this is different in that context because... Um, those those devices, uh, if I remember correctly, it's only the Mi Mini Plus. You can play Wi-Fi only locally. And what would separate this from those other devices is that feature, basically, to play online. The whole aspect of, like, earning crypto by doing that, I think is, I don't know, that would be here nor there. Uh, I guess if you earn, like, you know, uh, a hundredth of a, of a penny or something, then I guess that's better than nothing. I, I'm not really sure what to make of that part of it. Let's go around the panel to CPPC Tech and handheld hardware. Any thoughts on the BitBoy 1 in comparison or contrast to the Sui Play Zero X1? Um, well, going back to it, I may have kind of lumped these two in together because they were both crypto devices, which I'm not a fan of. But I mean, in contrast, the Playtron, Playtron has probably a little bit more of a powerful device um, outlook than this one does. I, I just don't really think this is a good device for her gamers to just jump on the board with i think it's uh it's being sold as a crypto wallet really um so i mean if you needed like a hard wallet to store your your crypto on or you are a big crypto boy and you've uh you've made it big and you got that lambo maybe this is on your radar but honestly there's just 
too many people who are getting burnt time and time again by crypto and NFTs, and it just doesn't really interest me. And I don't think it's going to interest a lot of other people. Just, yeah, I, I want to see it. I want to see it actually do well because I don't, I don't want to see stuff fail. It would be cool, you know, but I just think that it's not the best time and the best place for something like this to come out. It just feels bad, man. Handheld hardware, any thoughts on Gamers Generation and CPPC Tech and what they have said? Uh, I'm going to go out here and say that that is a really high entry point for an RK3566 processor. Just looking at the landscape of retro handhelds out there, we're in like the $100 park for a similar device from Ambernick or uh, what is it, Mio or the Pow Kitty. We're talking $400 more than another comparable device that you would probably, I mean, if you're trying to get into this whole retro space, well, also including this NFT stuff as well, this crypto stuff, that's a really high entry point just for you to also be able to play some of your retro games and maybe do some integration, which isn't going to have huge support at the start. That's a really high price point. I think when we're looking at the SUI device, I think that's going to be running like similar specs to other handhelds we've seen in the x86 realm. I think we're, did they, did they say what kind of processor it was going to use? I'm not sure it was um, mentioned yet. There's very little information. It, it did not come up in my research for this, but I, I think that's important because looking at this, we have said that both of these have a $500 price point, which speaks exactly to your point, handheld hardware. And the difference is that with the BitBoy $500 device, I can play Ninja Turtles. And with the Playtron Linux-based $500 device on the Sui Play Zero X1, I can play the latest AAA game with some limitation of course with it being a gaming handheld it's not going to be to the expectation that one would have on a desktop base graphics that's external an external graphics processor we're, we're dealing with an apu here but i can pull up assassin's creed mirage and i i'm not limited to ninja turtle and other retro classic games so that price point does does stand out as significant and gamers generation you can let me know if if this is the correct understanding but these classic retro handhelds that i've at least learned from your channel and and oks and his review they the prices are are economic i think is a fair word i mean we're, we're talking a hundred dollars to be able to play those games that really give us that warm sense of nostalgia of being a kid again yeah, you're absolutely right. And handheld hardware is absolutely right, too. Um, the price is very high, like like five times the price. Uh, like you could have all the retro handhelds I have behind me, which is like three of them for the price of this thing. Um, and that's not to say that what I had mentioned earlier doesn't propose value. Handheld hardware is spot on. It's an incredibly high price point. It would be like CPPC said, um combining like elements of a, like a crypto hardware wallet or whatever but yeah it's it's once again one of these like mishmashed niches that is probably not going to appeal to the masses so i have, think having a price oh go ahead go ahead handheld Hardly. having a price that would be somewhat similar to some of these other devices would probably garner a little bit more interest but they're still going to be held by, back by the fact that they don't have a track record of making solid devices like these other ones, like Mio, Pow Kitty, Ambernick. So even then, they're still going to get some hesitation from people from the retro side thinking that we want to go down this route. So I think that that price point is really just going to turn everyone off and they're not going to jump in. That That's an absolutely fair point, too. If Ambernick or... If Ambernick or Pal Kitty jumped in and made this device for 150, people would probably raise their eyebrows, but they would say, eh, okay, they're doing something different, and maybe someone would bite. Well, let's turn to the comments and see if any of any of those that are viewing our show tonight have any thoughts on the BitBoy One gaming handheld. Uh, unfortunately, no. 
I am I am not surprised just based on what we have discussed. This these two are if if anyone is thinking along the lines of of how I thought when I was first introduced to these two handhelds, they are quite novel with the blockchain cryptocurrency and use of, of NFTs throughout it. It's it's very different. So I think with that we can transition to our trivia night. Gamers Generation, would you like to share some trivia with us? Absolutely. Um, did you guys insert your coins yet? So uh, tonight we're doing some more trivia. If you're new to the trivia, we do two questions typically of questions related to handhelds or gaming as a whole. And we encourage you to participate in the chat, whether you're listening live or you're listening to the replay. And the question will first be asked to the panel, and then it will be pasted in the chat. So the first question I have is, I always like to start with a softball, or what I think is a softball. Um, and here's here it is. Question one is, the Nintendo DS featured two displays. One was a touchscreen. What type of display was the other one? A, LCD, B, LED, C, plasma, or D, CRT? CD. I have, I'm thinking it's an LCD. That's my yeah, they're all yeah. Because uh, the the last one was was CTV, and the one before that was plasma. It was definitely not a plasma. They couldn't make plasmas that small. Yeah, they couldn't. Yeah, they oh. had they had to be big. I, I remember reading about that. That was the nature of them. All right. So the panel is saying, the panel is saying LCD. I'm just waiting for. Paco to tell me that this is rigged. Uh, yeah, okay. let's oh. give, give others a chance. Um, all right, so the reveal of the answer is A, absolutely. You you gentlemen were correct. It is an LCD. All I right. Did say, I did say it was a softball, did I not? Yes. Yeah, yes, at first I did. thought it was going to be some yeah, weird yeah. trick question, though. <laughs> I it mean, was so easy. I was like, wait, that, what? That has happened. That has happened. <laughs> the, the, the one last week with the Game Boy, what was the first, what was it, The what was the first gaming handheld? And we were overthinking it going, oh, it was probably this Sony device. Instead, it wasn't the Game Boy, and it ended up being the Game Boy, if I'm remembering yeah. that correctly. Episode 10, right, everyone. Yeah. Right. Yes, right. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Paco has confirmed that it yeah. is rigged. It's rigged, uh, of course. Okay, so the next question here, the next question is, um, which of these, which of these is not a real handheld gaming console? Uh, and if you get this wrong, you're kicked out of the, you're kicked out of the group. Uh, a, the Gizmondo, B, the Engage, C, Wonder Swan, or D, GameSphere. GameSphere. That sounds so familiar. I feel bad. I don't know half of those choices. I I don't. Game Sphere. What? I, right. I feel like I've seen oh. that on a movie. What? Game it's Sphere? definitely it's definitely the last one. Game Sphere. That one. That one. Just I've never heard of that. Where have I heard that? Before? I think this I think there was. Movie. I think there was a uh, Game Sphere like pictured or something like that, but it was like it it, it was like kind of like a. a yeah, I don't know. I, I kind of vaguely remember it. I'm just having a mental block on even describing it. It was like a rendering that I saw a while back, but it, it's not a real handheld. It's not a real game. It was actually rendered as like a console, but was it, it never Was existed. it from South Park or something? I feel like I was watching a comedy and that word is mentioned. That's going to bother me. I'm going to have to, unless Gamers Generation will, will tell me where that's from, but that's driving me crazy right now. All right, so we have some we, we have some split decisions here. What are, what are you gentlemen choosing? I think somebody said it was the end gauge B. And somebody said it was something else. I'm going to go with game sphere because that one's just lighting up right now for me. I believe CPPC agreed with you on that handheld hardware. Is that your answer? Nah, I'm going to go out on left field and say a. Okay. Gizmondo. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Paco has said B. <laughs> I think he's, I think he's memeing on us now. He said the end game is not not a real handheld. I guess it depends oh. on your definition of real. Oh, it's from Drake and Josh. Okay. That's right. Okay. 
Okay, so Paco has has spoiled the answer. It is the answer is D. GameSphere is not a real handheld. Well, I'm glad yes, I can it was keep. Rigged. I'm I'm glad I can keep hosting the show because someone would have to take it over. All right, GameSphere, yeah, that was going to drive me crazy. I appreciate that, Pac Pac. I was thinking, the, where did the Gizmondo? The Gizmondo was a. Uh, made by uh, tiger electronics it was uh released in the uk oh, okay. sweden it was it was not on our market right so your definition there of real quote-unquote real handheld since it was made by tiger electronics i guess is subjective yeah true that <laughs> well we can entertain another trivia question or we can transition to our segment three let me leave it to everyone to see what the disposition is. I'm fine with another if you guys are ready for another. Gamers Generation. Let's go for have, another. Do you have another? Uh, yes, just one moment. Okay. One, what is okay. the... Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, no, I was just going to say we're going to close out with one that is hopefully not rigged. Okay? All right, so... What was the name? What was the name of the VR console released in 1995? A. Nintendo VR32, B. Virtual Boy, C. VR Cube, or D. The N64 VR. That one's easy. Virtual Boy. Yeah. Yeah, Virtual Boy. That's what I was thinking. That one stood out. I think that was relevant to a past trivia question. I'd have to look back the earlier episodes but i think we've talked about it before or i'm having major deja vu right now and there's a glitch in the matrix one of the two and he got his inspiration from low spec gamer all right so we have our answer uh it's still rigged paco yes the answer the entire panel and the chat got it was vir the virtual boy which by the way if you've not seen the trailer for or commercial for you have to look it up on youtube it's it's quite uh interesting i think i actually covered i did a vr segment early early when i was doing the youtube channel and i think the virtual boy was was mentioned in that segment that i did on vr technology and gaming yeah it retailed for 180 bucks It was destined to be something so good, except it was ahead of Nintendo time. lawyers. Yeah, Nintendo lawyers shut it down. Never you guys seen. haven't watched. Low Spec Gamer had a really good video on it. Check that out. All right, we can transition to segment three of our show. And yes, we're going to talk about another handheld gaming handheld in development this one is an intel one and it is slated to release this month during a very recent special event in china aokzo unveiled its a2 ultra gaming handheld that will come with the ultra 7 155h intel apu making this the third gaming device that can function as a handheld with the Intel Core Ultra 7 155H and Windows 11 on the podcast. It has a 7 inch 1920 by 1200 screen, 32 and 64 gigabyte memory options as LPDDR5X at 7467 megahertz, Wi Fi 7 and Bluetooth 5.4. The battery has 12600. MAH, so 12,600 MAH there. It has a PCIe Gen 4 SSD with a 2280 form factor, and that's custom for those Chinese handhelds too. The handheld has a release date of April 2024. However, pricing and specific availability as far as date are yet to be confirmed. It is not available yet for sale. So let me transition now to the panel. We have shown the expectations of performance with this specific Intel APU with Cyberpunk 2077 on the show in episode 9. Can we expect anything more or less perhaps with this Intel APU making its way into another gaming handheld to release this year? Um, 
As far as the raw performance of it, when it comes to gaming, it's still up in the air. I think there's definitely going to be some driver improvements. Um, I'm not sure if any of you guys watching have watched the latest Gamers Nexus video where he covered in depth the MSI Claw yeah. and how a lot of his benchmarks weren't able to run and he had like just a, a, a really difficult time recommending it and, and just did not like it at all. He said it was the worst handheld he'd ever tested and I strongly agree with that. Um, but it more or less comes down to the way this APU is performing. It's just not up to par. The 1% lows are really bad and that is something that some people are showcasing and some people are avoiding it because they want to stay hopeful. And that's great. That's that's very, you know, very nice. But I think we should just be honest at this point since we've had enough of these handhelds with the Intel APUs to compare that the gaming performance is not where AMD is at all. And even on a day one launch, day two, day, it doesn't matter at this point. It's It's kind of still struggling. But this one does have a little bit of a higher TDP than the Claw, so there's that. It might help. I don't. I don't know. I do like that it's got a 2280. That's a, a really good thing to see. Hopefully, they didn't hide it under the APU heatsink and fans and make you nearly have a heart attack taking it apart. But yeah, uh, I kind of want to see this. I actually do. Im- enjoy seeing intel still trying and a lot of other manufacturers still trying with intel don't give up intel there's always hope so yeah it, it does like seem to be a good device if it comes in at the right price point but i don't think it's going to break any grounds with performance it really is going to come down to that price point if they can introduce this at a nice price to performance this would be a good option for anyone who is an intel gamer who might want to give some uh some money to intel and maybe help them push along the process. Cameras generation and handheld hardware. Any thoughts on this device? Getting back to CPPC's point about uh, Gamers Nexus video, I did watch it and uh, he had a really good argument about the price to performance comparing to the Z1 non-extreme ROG Ally. And, uh, yeah, I think if the price point is, is reasonable, I think this could do okay, but still there's a curve to get this to a point where people can just pick it up and play it. Um, there's a lot of tweaking. I'm still hopeful for Intel, but it is kind of a little bit like deja vu back with Tiger Lake came out swinging more power than Vega and we still had issues. So I'll, I'll hold on hope, but. If this price to performance ratio is not there, it's probably not going to do good. Gamers Generation, you have been quiet on this one. Any thoughts? I'm sorry. I'm trying to uh, withhold my laughter yeah. just, just a little bit uh, because I love what you have on the screen, Joe. It's a picture of our great leader, Zong, which if anyone has been following the whole AOK Zoe history is is just um a fable for the ages anyway um i think it was steve from gamers nexus who said that there are no bad products but there are bad prices i mean obviously we know he's like being a little facetious about that or that statement is a little bit um hyperbole but generally speaking i do agree with that right i mean a lot of the products out there that we would deem are bad can be good if at the right price point like I have been um, a strong proponent of like the Quest 3 for a long time because of its entry point. And I had had numerous people ask me if the Vision Pro was worth it at $3,500. And I said, no. If that thing was $1,000, though, you know, of, of course, my tune would be very different. And so with another one of these Intel handhelds, and again, at that price point, yeah, it just doesn't look appealing. Uh, I don't think it looks appealing to me, and it probably doesn't look appealing to a lot of people out there who either have a handheld already um, that performs pretty well uh, in one of their uh, Ryzen handhelds, or even if they have a claw. Like, why would you want this? You know, why do you need it? It it seems unnecessary. Uh, That, coupled with the fact that, like, um, AOK Zoe is just, um, you know, like, looks like they're just repackaging one of these things. I'm, you know, very much classic and in line with 1X Player 2's uh, MO. Or, um, yeah, 
I don't know. I, it doesn't feel like um like it's really worth the, the money that you probably have to spend for it. Any thoughts on why Aoxo wanted to transition from the AMD APUs to the Intel Core APU? Why not just stay with the AMD APU? Um, I was wondering that too, and I'm starting to see some people mention this and, and ask. And at first, I kind of thought it was, uh, you know, I don't know, but what if there's a value there as far as pricing goes? What if, what if maybe Intel has offered a substantial discount on them or some type of value to where they're getting an incentive on the profit or on the back end or somehow, some way, it's financially interesting to them? because Intel may just really need to get these out or something just smells like there's something profit wise that's driving this. So I don't know. It definitely doesn't seem like they're giving us something that they know is good. It's more along the lines of it's a test or it's got to be something profit. It's possible as it is a typical with these Chinese handhelds to be at a economic price to something of that of like the Lenovo Legion Go or the ROG Ally. I have heard that Chinese handhelds are described as luxury handhelds. So it it's possible that maybe that Aoxo wanted to break that pattern with this, but with 1X Player and the X1, we saw the Intel Core Ultra come in at a high price point. However, that was for a three-in-one device and not just a handheld. So that's an interesting point that you bring up as a possibility. Gamers Generation handheld hardware, any thoughts on that potential angle that AOXO may be possibly pursuing? Yeah, I'll take a stab at it. Um, let's take a look at it from a design perspective. Uh, it looks like they're reusing a lot of the components that they're already putting into other stuff. And I don't know what kind of effort is required to go between an AMD and an Intel CPU, but I'm sure they're going to use a very similar motherboard layout. And maybe from a design perspective, it's not horrible to swap out CPUs. And then it's just a matter of manufacturing it. If the price point is really good from what they can get from Intel, and they expect based on like the X1 sales that they'll get, you know, a couple hundred or a thousand sales. Maybe they've got it marked up such that they'll make a quick buck and and call it a day. Yeah, um, I had a cynical thought about this, but I think CPPC, what CPPC said was actually my initial thought about uh, the MSI Claw. I thought maybe there were no review units sent out to anybody or they are very hush-hush about everything because Intel was actually instructing MSI to basically, you know, just say nothing about it. And so I do think that that is a possibility. And if nothing else, you know, this uh, A2 Ultra and the MSI Claw could be just, um, you know, just footers in a, in a in a board meeting at Intel to say, hey, this year we launched two um you know gaming handhelds so we're you know um you know up and coming in this handheld space that amd has dominated just to you know appease shareholders i could totally see that my cynical take on it was that also these intel chips are basically intel chips that uh one x player is not using uh you know maybe the they have leftovers from their x1s that they were planning to sell and so that they're just throwing it into here um, I wouldn't be surprised by that simply because they do have a track record of, I guess, soft refreshing. I'm not saying like actually refreshing because there were, I believe it's the One X Player X1 um, and even the Aokazoe A1, which have like newer chips than their originals were. And they were kind of just like quietly ushered in. So if I'm not mistaken, the One X Player, uh, the One X Player X, uh, I'm sorry, the original One X Player um uh, the the original One X Player device, it had a Ryzen chip in it. It was maybe the 5800U, I think it was. And then later, um, more more recently, I think in the past year, they released another one that had a 6800U and even a 7840U, if I'm not mistaken. 
And so, like, they've done this before as 1X player. And with the A1, they even did this as well in the, in the form of an A, uh, A1 Pro. Yeah, that's a good point. They did switch between Intel and AMD chips quite a bit. Between the full-size 1X player, the 1X player mini... Yeah, that's both right. of those released as Intel, and then they made the 4800U big one and a 5700U big one, and then they made the 5800U and 6800U minis. So yeah, they've got the experience to go between A and B and Intel. It may be a very quick exercise for them to go between the two and get a new motherboard printed and... Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, like... We've seen also I and Neo. We suspect they're doing that also with their mini PCs, like the AM01 or AM02 or something. They're doing that with like old, uh, old AMD uh, uh, APUs. And like, there's nothing wrong with that practice as a whole. It's just the price point, like we were just talking about, right? If these things are overpriced, then I mean, no one should be buying them. It's it's being sold for the right price. Then yeah, I'm all for it. Yeah, the One X Player X1. If it was not a versatile handheld, then it definitely would have been considered overpriced it is still even though it is a three-in-one device it still is i i consider it an expensive device i think others would ag agree on that too but the versatility was nice with that one so it it is interesting also how one x player they attempted to release or re not attempted they released their version or their device with an Intel APU and then this is Aoxo's turn in doing that but did not go with a versatile device but went with a handheld an actual gaming handheld so it it as if it is their turn with trying Intel here All right well I think we can turn to the comments to see what others may be saying about the Aoxo A2 Ultra before we transition gamers generation any comments yes uh paco is insisting that we do not besmirch the noble name of aok -okay zoe or zong oh no that is that is not our intention on the channel at all so we we like to research present the information have a sound discussion and then let everyone decide what they reason and they feel they want to do as far as moving forward with with that handheld so yes that is that is something we will not do there for that but it it is a it is a it's a good picture i i mean he looks very happy to be presenting the product there so hopefully this this does well and and to it was i think it was cppc's point hopefully we can get that performance something close to the expectation that we want with this Intel APU. Another just quick thing on it, it, it does have that 64 and 32 gig options, and I, I highly, highly applaud them for that. Um, looks like their joysticks have removable caps as well. There's a, Like I said, there's a lot of redeeming features about this handheld that would make it more uh, appealing, even if Intel's performance right now isn't up to par. It just, it, it definitely has the features that I look for in a device. It reminds me of the 1X Fly somewhat in its form factor, and I really like the form factor of the 1X Fly. It, I, I, Other than the Intel APU, it would be a duplicate of the 1X Fly for me, especially the previous ones would be a, a duplicate because of using the AMD APU, but it's for someone that has a 1X Fly and considering purchasing the a Aoxo A2, Intel, it, at least thus far, has not convinced me, hey, for the One X Fly form factor, you want an Intel one and an AMD one. <clears throat> I rather have the, the AMD one right now, and I, I think there is potential. I am in the camp of believing in the potential for the gaming experience with the Intel APU to improve and and actually, that is from OK, one of OKS, his latest video, actually, where he was showing the game score with the various softwares that he was using. 
and how the expectations should be higher. And in paraphrasing his conclusion with that, it's a to what extent have the drivers just not yet caught up to the potential that the Intel APU, specifically the ARC graphics component, can provide for gamers on this APU. Joe, you're not wrong about the similarities with the One X Fly. There's actually a lot of discussion about it being that the A2 is a quote-unquote inferior version. Not the A2 Ultra, but the A2 itself because it has uh, essentially all the same features and everything as the One X Fly, uh, same APU and everything, but it doesn't have you know the customizable uh, RGB badge, and it's uh, and the display is only 60 hertz versus 120. Okay. So there's yeah. so there's a lot of people who are just thinking. Uh, the A2 was essentially the leftover or, um, uh, you know, components that didn't pass quality check. Yeah, and we go back around to, will it make a difference with the price point? Will gamers be willing to sacrifice having that 120 hertz display for a lower price point? Or is it, are, are gamers as a majority willing to pay a little more for having that 120 hertz display uh l last thing i'd like to say about this um company uh joe is that um for the a1 i did have an a1 and for what it's worth the quality of that device was quite good i felt um you know the build quality overall the performance of it was great mind you that was running a 6800 u so that was expected to have um, the Ryzen type uh, rate, you know, Radeon level performance. This thing, um, you know, just expect more of what you see with the claw, right? I, I think there are, yeah, I think there are similarities with that. Absolutely. All right. Well, we can transition to our fourth and final segment for the show. Media is circulating that a Lenovo Legion Go 2 is in development, and we have covered on the show that there is the possibility of a ROG Ally 2 later this year. The credibility for this is from Lenovo's APAC Gaming Category Manager stating that the next generation Legion Go will have, quote, even more features, end quote. Legion Go released in October 2023, and people, it is at least my impression that people are still picking it up. CPPC Tech on his channel, he has shown that he has recently picked it up and been modding it as well. Some understandable areas to upgrade either gaming handheld, whether it's the ROG Ally or the Lenovo Legion Go, is the battery the display type, this is the IPS display versus the OLED display, and thermal management, just to name three areas. So let me transition now to the panel. Let me start with you, if I may, CPPC Tech. You have installed mods on the ROG Ally, and one at least, specifically your airflow cooling mod upgrade, that is the, the name that I came up with it. I think it may have a better and more formal name. This was shown even on Gamers Nexus, and you have recently installed mods on the Lenovo Legion Go. Those are some of your latest videos with that. Taking into consideration what you have modded with the Asus and Lenovo gaming handhelds, upgrading on them with your mods, what can we expect as far as suitable upgrades for these two devices in the next iteration, the second one? Sure. Um, so I really am a huge fan of the Legion Go. I have really uh, loved using it and playing with it and modding it. There's a lot more room for upgrades and, and mods. So it's definitely a fun device to tinker with. And the things that I'm noticing that they pointed out in this this uh, article here on Tom's Guide of what they were looking for, it, it definitely some of those definitely need to come into play, like the OLED, better thermals. I, I completely agree. Uh, but one of them was like just you know not even mentioning the the RAM issue. There there's really a big issue with these handhelds, and and some people fail to agree because they just aren't looking into it as deep. I guess. RAM, we need more RAM. If the new one does not have 32 gigs of RAM, I think we should all just get out the torches. Let's just let's just riot and and it, no, don't don't riot. But I think we should protest and say, look, we need to draw the line with 32 gigs of RAM moving forward because Windows has so many services that run in the background. We've got all our apps. I like to listen to Spotify while I game. 
I don't want to be limited to just my game running and that's it. What if I want to stream on OBS? What if I want to record on OBS? What if there's so many other things that gamers do that you can't do here without limiting your RAM usage? And, and that's part of the problem. We need that. The grips are something that I improved on. There was a sharp angle on the bottom lower left and right corners that just dug into my hands and my hands are kind of small they're a little thin but if you have thicker bigger hands maybe it's not a big deal to you but i noticed that complaint amongst a lot of people that they didn't like the way it feel way it felt in their hands so 3d printing my own controller grips or uh housings rather to replace the stock housings significantly improved it the thermals on the nvme get spicy super spicy and if you were to upgrade to a two terabyte or four terabyte drive you'll quickly possibly run into blue screen issues like some other people have had and if you notice the thermals they're well above the recommended thermal range of these nvme drives from the manufacturers themselves which i have spoken to many of them directly about this and you don't really have a lot of room for a heat sink or if any so i think the 2280 option needs to be employed uh, you can you can really spread that heat out a lot more on a 2280 drive. You're going to get better prices on the drives themselves, so it could help lower the cost for the manufacturing process if they were to go to a 2280 drive. I think that's why a lot of these other Chinese handhelds are doing the 2280 drives now. Uh, they're, they're a lot better pricing on those. If you look at the cooling aspect, there's a hot spot up near the charging port, and that gets extremely hot as well. So they need to find a way to kind of cool that off and better venting as well. OLED screen, I would love to see that. I would love to see that. But quite honestly, the biggest complaint about people who I see who are not buying this handheld, they say that VRR and FreeSync and all that is like the line that they can't cross of not having it. It, it is a big deal to some. It's not a big deal for me. But having some type of variable refresh rate would be nice to see. So if they could kill two birds with one stone, give us an OLED and give us variable refresh rate, I think they would really sell a lot more of these devices. Because that seems to be kind of the common thing I hear of people who own the Ally or they own any of these other handhelds. They're like, nope, I can't do it. It doesn't have VRR. So maybe we could see some of those things. But I don't know. What do you guys think? What are you looking for? Having been a Legion Go fan before it released, I'm going to agree with you 100% more RAM. I want to see 32 gigabyte options. And yeah, maybe they can make a 16 gigabyte variant too for people who want to save a few bucks, but please give us 32 gigabytes. Um, the other thing that I really like about the Legion Go is the fact that they really did put a lot of effort into the hardware up front to make the controllers work wirelessly. And, you know, in my video where I go over the features of the Legion Go, I was telling you that you can turn them into, like, Joy-Con, mini Xbox controllers. Like, they put a lot of effort into the hardware to make it work. And the fact that it has, like, a little Bluetooth mode where you can use it as, like, a little Xbox controller, that that's a lot of forethought on Lenovo's side. And I really hope they carry that forward into the next generation. I would also like to see if they could maybe keep the removable controllers and keep some backward compatibility with them. Maybe make a new design, something that's a little bit more ergonomic and doesn't have those sharp edges. But something that maybe we could take over to our original Legion Go. As much as I don't want to see a new design come out so quickly and then to just toss aside support for the old one, it'd be nice if they could bring that in too. And I know they've got some accessories coming out soon. How are those going to play in? Are they just going to create a new one and just kind of shove everything aside? I really like to see them pay homage to the first design and support it or make some sort of compatibility so that people can still carry stuff over or get new stuff and use it with the old one. I think that'd be kind of cool if they did that. From the display side, yeah, I really would like to see a landscape display. Um, it doesn't impact me that much, but there are people that it does impact and seeing something that would be landscape and VRR would be the next step as well. Oh, and mappable. Um, when we have a little Xbox mini mode where you turn each controller into its own little mini Xbox controller, 
can we please map which button does what? Right now, we can't make it like a full... Um, if you want to play like certain indie games, you don't get all the buttons that you might need to play an indie game, but you can't map anything on these little mini Xbox controllers. So they're only good for certain indie games. So please give us mappable buttons. All right. And Gamers Generation, any thoughts for the ROG Ally 2 and the Lenovo Legion 2? Uh, yeah, I think uh, in addition to what both handheld hardware and uh, CPPC said, I think, um, I, I guess just sort of springboarding from that, I agree every, with everything that's said. The new display technology like OLED, VR, that would be great. New battery uh, or larger battery, if they could somehow increase it to like the 60, 65 or even like 75 that some of these Chinese handhelds have, that would be nice. Although I'm being realistic, it would probably add a lot more weight that is probably going to turn some people off. I think for the backwards compatibility for controllers, that's also a great idea. I would love to see different controllers. Like there's been this idea that's been th floating around and I, I'm sure I'm not the only person of this idea of like having symmetrical, um, you know, like go cons or whatever. So basically it's got the two track pods on each side and maybe it has like a dual FPS mode that could be used for like flight sims or something like that. Basically, you know, I just want them to innovate the same way that they did f with the go the first time and come up with these more uh, new controllers uh, along with the controller connector, right? Besides that, I mean, I think it was actually, I think it was actually um, maybe Jay's two cents that said it uh, or, or Steve, I'm not sure. One of them said it. it's, it's actually a little bit weird that we still don't have like an official dock or anything for the go. So yeah, like more accessories and stuff just to flesh out their ecosystem would be great for that. I think beyond that, um, you know, they're, they're already doing most things right. And I don't think that we need more from that from the ROG ally side. Um, I don't really think for that form factor, there's a lot more they can improve on other than the larger battery. But again, you know, um, that's going to turn some people off. So maybe if they basically borrow the claws, like, you know, larger grips and sneak in that larger battery, but not use an Intel APU, like maybe that's enough for them. Uh, and people would be happy with that. It's yeah, interesting. Use... Oh, go ahead, CPPC. I was, about, I was about to say, if Ally tries the whole Intel platform, I think people would re really, really be mad. <laughs> Hopefully, it's we'll see that. Yeah. I mean, choosing between, yeah, the Intel and the 8840U when they have so much success on the 7840U, that would be very surprising. I mean, it's possible, but I, I would be asking why i think it's interesting what you mentioned too about the docks because i'm looking at my while you were talking gamers generation i was looking at my rog ally and my lenovo legion go on my desk over here where i create my videos and i was realizing that for my rog ally i'm using a jsox that universal standard dock and then the lenovo legion go it's just sitting upright based on the little extender arm on the back and then it's connected to my eGPU for a dock for those what what would you like to see would you like to see something similar to what JSOX has done with making its universal docks like the universal RGB or is there something that maybe specifically Lenovo and RO and, and Asus can do maybe even with Lenovo a dock that can somehow further accommodate the joy cons in a way they don't have to be connected directly to the device they can be docked as well on the side and I, I just thought of that off the top of my head not that there's any significance in it but do you have any specific thoughts on that or just wanted to mention a dock in general uh, yeah, I do actually have specific thoughts on it. Um, I'm actually kind of showing my hand here. Uh, I, I feel like Lenovo has, has some space to, uh, kind of grow with this. Uh, I think some integration with the AR glasses that they have released would be great. That can be both included, uh, uh, have some integration with a dock and just be completely separate too. The problem with those glasses, I, I've not used them personally. I know, um, 
both uh, Windec Tech and OKS Gamer have used those, but they are very similar in technology to all the ones that I've uh, used and tested already on my channel. And my understanding of them is that they don't play that well with the existing Go system. So what I mean by that is if you detach the Go controllers, you are still tethered because those glasses have to be plugged into the device itself. So if there's a way to create this kind of streaming connector to then allow it to just connect to have the glasses connect to um, the connector that goes in between the Go controllers and maybe also powers the device, you now have something that is completely unique to that system and would allow your, your Go to be docked um, somewhere else, maybe in your room, and then you playing in your bed or something like that. There's literally no other handheld that can do this, except for maybe that like techno handheld that we talked about before, which is you know still in its early stages. And speaking of the glasses with the Lenovo Legion Go, would a Lenovo Legion Go 2, do you think there is a future in introducing a, a second iteration of the glasses to go with the Lenovo Legion 2 Go 2, or it would just be the, the handheld and then you would use the same glasses that were introduced soon after the, the first iteration? There is, but I don't think there's not enough justification to, let's just say, like, upgrade it. Now, those glasses were very limited in terms of their availability. They were, as my understanding, a, uh, a rebrand or a refresh of, of pre-existing glasses that they sold in China. So they very much could release, like, a newer version that is basically using the, the same te optics technology as the, uh, the Asus glasses that were shown at CES. So, I mean, Asus didn't show these off, I don't believe, with um, being used with the Ally, but they could do a very similar thing too, or have a very similar setup. Okay. Well, and I, for me, I agree with what each of you has said in looking forward to upgraded devices i am very happy with the rog ally as it is and i'm very happy with the lenovo legion go as it is i i do think that it would be the memory for me that would really push me to make that upgrade if hypothetically both were to release this year that is essential but in a way i i still think that they can do fine on their own for how they are right now. And I'd be willing to wait another one to two years for something different. And, and you three may disagree with me on that. And, and that may be the way that I think that way is because of the other, the Chinese handhelds have that option of having more memory, but it's unfortunate that right now, if you want 32 gigabyte of memory in a handheld, you're going to have to look to the Chinese handhelds for that, and that option is not available yet to go to your lo local Best Buy and and buy them. And, and that's what we've talked about. So if an ROG Ally 2 and hypothetically a Lenovo Legion Go 2 were to release this year with that added memory, that 32, then I, I would be happy for gamers to have that option if they want to upgrade. And hopefully there will be some thermal improvements as well. Joe, can I ask a hypothetical question on yeah, the sure. panel? All right. So, gentlemen, let's pretend that it is Q3 or Q4 of this year, and there's an Ally 2 or Ally Go that's coming to the market. Basically, Asus and Lenovo are more or less confirming this. Let's pretend it's the bare minimum of a refresh, meaning that the Ally is the Ally, the Go is the Go. Realistically, the only difference is now there's an 8840U in there. You know, maybe they changed... Uh, a little bit of the thermal design or whatever, but I'm saying essentially that's all that's different. How much do you think they can realistically charge for these handhelds? Okay, so there's no memory upgrade. It's just the APU, right? Correct. It's just Correct. the AD. Okay. Uh, this this may be absurd. So you you three can let me know if it is, but I I would say a hundred dollars. <laughs> I would say yeah. add a hundred dollars. So. Yeah. So, so oh. wait, so you're, uh, I'm sorry. So you're saying I, like add a hundred dollars to whatever the current 
uh, uh, the current Z1e pricing is. Yeah. Or had a hundred dollars from the MSRP. The MSRP. No, no. I, I mean, like the launch MSRP. Yeah, I would say the launch MSRP at a hundred dollars. So an ally, so an ally would be eight hundred dollars, and a go would be eight hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. I, I mean, feel free to okay. argue, debate. Yeah, I, just taking I'll, a look where Chinese companies go. I'm, I'm going to say it should be the same MSRP. That would be nice. I think yeah, that, would I'm gonna, be, that would be great if it could. Be. I'm going to jump into if all they did was change it to an 8840, and they did not give us anything else. No, nah, it should be the same price. There, there's definitely no no reason to charge more just because they refreshed with the current APU. Now, if they give us more RAM, oh, I'll run out and buy it. Like gladly at a hundred dollars more but if they give us just a refresh of the apu i'm going to tell them they can keep it unless they're going to send me one for review but i'm not going to go spend my money on a two to five percent difference if if really even if it's a little more than that i'm still just going to wait till a handheld will give me my 32 gigs okay so part two of the question and i hope and i hope somehow asus and lenovo you guys it's a good question notes on the prices now, uh, only, only it, it is 8840 or you know, Z2 Extreme, let's call it. That's the only change they're making, as well as the 32 gigs of RAM. Now, how much can they charge? Give me 32 gigs, I'll give you an extra 200 bucks. Yeah, see, oh, I, I was going to say 200 wow. as my answer as well with the added memory. But again, I am on the side of, hey, make it the same price, because... I, I'm not going to vouch to to pay more. I mean, gen generally speaking, I mean, I would rather pay the the same amount as as everyone else. I'm sure would, but from a standpoint of how practical that can be, I I don't know. All right, so you gentlemen are basically saying Z2 Extreme uh, or 8840U, whatever they decide to call it, and 32 gigs of RAM. The price could be nine hundred dollars. What about you, handheld hardware? Yeah, I'm going to say $100 for the 8840U and 32 gigs of RAM. Yeah, so so $800 is what you would say. $800, and, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the only reason I, I would say 200 is just because if if you look at the, the utility for me and what I do, it would be worth my investment because of how much I like to be able to do that needs more RAM, and I'm just struggling because I, I'll end up having to have two devices going if I want to listen to music and play a game at the same time but yeah give us the 32 gigs and i think a lot more people have reason to justify it and and that's that it just it shouldn't be this tough to beg these manufacturers to listen to the gamers it it's like i i don't know if they're they're just falling on deaf ears or if they're not hearing us or people aren't stinking about it like they should be but i've heard it all across different channels large channels that that 32 should be the bare minimal i mean it's different when you have a desktop that has its own dedicated VRAM on your GPU. It's not a big deal to be on 16 gigs. And so non-handheld gamers have this like strong thing that they won't move off of. 16 gigs is not, it's plenty, it's plenty. These these PC master race people who are on the Reddit forums, you know, will will trash you if you jump in there and say th they you need 32 gigs. They'll still to this day, it blows my mind. But in the handheld gaming space, anyone who owns an Ally or Legion Go or any of these other ones who pays attention to a lot of these games and how much they're using, how much your your Windows is using, how much your services are running in the background, it definitely leads you to want more and you know you could do better with more. Those 1% lows would be better because you're not bumping off of that page file constantly. There's a lot of other limitations as well, but that is something that we need in a handheld since we don't have dedicated VRAM yet. And it just needs to be that way unless they can somehow find a way to give us dedicated VRAM later down the road. For right now, 16, 16 gigs is just not enough when you share your VRAM. Yeah, the, the one thing um, I wanted to figure based on both of what, uh, based on you were saying, uh, all of you were saying about what you would pay for, how much you think it would cost is there is some shiny uh there is um you know a light at the end of the tunnel is what i would say if 
ago and an ally were to launch with an 8840U and 32 gigs of RAM and it was $900, I think it would turn away a lot of people based on that price. However, I do think at that point, within the next six months to a year, there is a high possibility or at least reasonable possibility that Valve will release um, a Deck 2 or a Deck Pro and that will force the prices down. Interesting. Yeah, I would I would yeah. laugh if if Steam did it first. If Steam just says, "Oh, yep, here's Steam Deck with the 32 gigabyte option," and then I would think that Lenovo and Asus would be rushing to get something out that would put the pressure on them. Yeah, yeah. the on, the only reason why I'm I'm speculating that is because um, by the time Q1 rolls around. Um, meaning that these devices are, you know, just a couple months old, a, a go to an ally to that is basically three years from the, the release date of a Steam Deck. And I'm sure by that time, there's significant enough gains. I mean, we're already seeing some of these gains in the Steam Deck OLED to justify, you know, a, a refresh or a, a sequel, let's say. Yeah, if they release that, it would be game over for some of the other players who are charging too much for theirs i think a lot of people would just be like well it, it would be worth it to buy the steam deck too at that point especially if it came with 32 gigs because there's so many people out there who just maybe not want to spend all that money on a legion go or ally but they really love their steam deck but they want an upgrade then if valve comes in at a cheaper price point and cuts the competition then it's good for everyone because the people who do want the ally and the legion go who just really are really close on the money then yeah if it forces that price down heck yeah i'm all for it well we can transition into some segues to wrap up the show <clears throat> excuse me and let's let's talk about games that we are playing gamers generation we'll start with you playing playing any games uh, yeah, still trying to slog my way through Final Fantasy VII Remake. I was actually really hoping to um, start Spider-Man Miles Morales and then get to two, but, uh, you know, things have not worked out so well for me there. CPPC or handheld hardware? Any games lately? Yeah, I've been playing Gigantic. Uh, it's a game that released uh, seven or eight years ago. I was a beta tester, and... Uh, Least and promptly fell flat on its face but it's been resurrected and it seems to have quite an active community already there's been some you know day one issues server issues that it looks like they're working to fix so i'm happy to see this game come back from the dead and hope it sticks around for longer than six months okay and for myself i have been playing Immortals of Avium on my X1 and with the eGPU connected. And then I've also been working on another video playing on the Lenovo Legion Go Cyberpunk 2077, also with the eGPU. And I'm really excited this week, two games release, or rather for one, an expansion on the 17th, the Dead Island 2 Sola DLC releases and on the 18th i am especially excited for this one by the developers of ori new moon they are releasing early release no rest for the wicked which is like a combination of diablo and dark souls in a ori style world so that's that's going to be really interesting i think i've really liked the gameplay so far And that sounds at, interesting. it is, yeah, definitely give, give it a look up on, on steam. So that that's Thursday that the game will release. I'm looking forward to seeing how that will work on the steam deck, the Ori games, they do really well on the steam deck. So I'm, I'm thinking that this, this has a possibility to do so as well, even with it being early release, but we will see. And next videos, gentlemen, Gamers Generation, what are you working on? I'm working on my um, XG mobile review. Now, that's with the AMD 
external yeah, graphics. That's, okay, that's correct. Yeah, um, I have the 6850 MXT courtesy uh, Windex Tech. I'll be reviewing that uh, with use of my Ally and also my X16 Flow. Uh, let's say it's not pretty, but if you want a more powerful GPU, there is one. Okay. And CPPC, how about yourself? Uh, working on some more mod videos. I got a couple coming out for the Ally, a couple coming out for the Legion Go, and then a review for the Ambernick 556. Okay, yeah. Ambernick device. Handheld hardware, how about yourself? What are you working on? I'm working on my uh, app again, and uh, I'm trying to bring I and Neo Flip DS owners some support. I've got a drafted application where you can do a little keyboard action on that lower screen both with your nice. fingers and with the joystick so i'm trying to get an i and neo flip ds owner to try it out and okay. if anyone's watching this and sees this please let me know i'd love to get your help okay all right hopefully we we get some comments on on this video too about that but um, i'm very excited for the progress you've been working really hard on on that software and I'm glad that we got to talk about it too on episode 10 of the show and using adjusting EPP within it. As far as myself, I am working on two videos. The first video I'm working on is another ultimate FPS mode. I did the first one on High on Life, High on Knife DLC, and this one is going to be on Cyberpunk 2077. And the ultimate FPS setup is going to change to incorporate the eGPU with the Lenovo Legion Go. And kudos to Windeck Tech for a video that he released on getting those drive those uh, the 780M AMD driver to work with the Z1 Extreme graphics component. And then the other one I'm working on is on the X1 and games on that. And I'm just, that's going to be after the ultimate FPS mode because I, I would like to show the connector for the Joy Cons in that. And I'm hoping to get that by the end of the month, handheld hardware. I don't know if you ordered the, the Joy Con connector for your X1, but hopefully we get that by the end of the month here in April. I did, and I'm looking forward to receiving mine too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That will, that will be fun to have that and i think that wraps it up for us gentlemen any final thoughts before we conclude the show i think that covered everything i think we did we had a full show indeed and we're getting to our usual time any final comments gamers generation from anyone not tonight. It's a quiet it's Monday a quiet. night. Yeah, it is Monday. And thank you all again. Thank you for uh, Pock Pock, especially. Thank you for those in the, in the comments for accommodating our Monday night for this. But we will return to the, the Sunday night usual time. So I had a, a family obligation on Sunday night. So thank you all for giving me that opportunity to do that. And... Thank you for tuning into the show. We look forward to reading what you think about what we have discussed in the show. And we will end the show with that. Take care, everyone. Have a great week. Have a good afternoon, good evening, or good night. Thanks.